Oh yeah, once you add Rick Rack, you'll never go back. The ultimate motorcycle luggage rack solution. Forget those messy straps and bungee cords go strapless. With a Rick Rack quick attach luggage system and quality bag, head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store. Get hooked up now. Hey, Bikeaholic, Zero 3D has a wide variety of innovative products for your Harley-Davidson and brand new line for your Honda Goldwing named Gold Strike. That's right, affordable chrome lighting and comfort products and can bus made simple with a plug and play lighting system. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store and check out our full line of Zero 3D products. Welcome back, you freaking bikeaholics. This is the podcast for the motorcycle majority, the big MM. That's right, also known as the, go ahead and say it, 99%. That's right, large and in charge of the motorcycle scene. More than any time in freaking history, I guarantee it. By listening to this very podcast, that's right, by being involved, you are part of what we call hashtag the biker revolution. Be proud of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have just one question for you before we get started. What are you waiting for? Mount up. Let me take you on another wild ass ride. That's right. Ryan Erlacher here, your host of the Law Biting Biker podcast and your high tech redneck. Thank you so much for being here. Um, got an episode here for you. I want to announce just a few things and uh, it's actually a, a new podcast. Uh, not necessarily one I'm doing, but somebody right here at Law Abiding Biker Media that you've heard on these mics many times getting up and going with our podcast. And I'll dive in just a little bit deeper to that in just a moment. But I do want to tell you guys about a new free video. It's been out for some time, but I always like to announce them here on the show. Um, the YouTube channel is still blowing up over there. Make sure word of mouth is important to us, guys. Spread it around. Um, the more subscribers we can get over on that channel, you know, the more social proof and the numbers just keep growing. Um, I really feel like we serve the biker community over there too on the YouTube channel. So the new free video that's out is Draco Drift Motorcycle Protective Riding Jeans. It's a biker review and test by none other right here. That's right, your host. And uh, I have worn those uh, on uh, uh, thousands of miles. And I've, I've tested quite a few different uh, Kevlar riding jeans. And as you guys know, um, traditional gear is fine. And I have no problem with that. A lot of the guys I ride with wear traditional gear, but I'm more into the uh, progressive gear. Uh, a lot of these jeans, you can't even tell they're motorcycle jeans, but yep. They offer just superb protection with Kevlar panels. No, a lot of them are not cheap. I get it, um, but they last a long time. And I can literally walk around and you would have no clue, but yet I'm more protected than most of the guys I ride with. Um, a lot more protective than chaps because uh, those don't wrap around your ass and all that kind of stuff, guys. And these, a lot of these jeans have panels all the way through. Some of them just have panels in key areas, such as these Draco Drift, but then there's others that have panels all the way through. And again, that uh, directly correlates to the price of those jeans, of course, too. So link will be in the show notes to that review and test and see if you're interested in those Draco Drifts. We've got affiliate links, of course, uh, below those videos if you want to get hooked up. But uh, lawabidingbreaker.com forward slash whatever episode number this is, is how, of course, you get the show notes and any links that I ever talk about in any episode. Uh, that's how you guys do it. So uh, you know, I appreciate our uh, regular sponsors, uh, sponsors to the show, but I want to thank the following people because they too are direct sponsors making it happen. That's right. Our beloved patron, Stephen Boyd of JS Mississippi, Raul Rary, or excuse me, Paul Rary of Brentwood, California, top tier. That's right. Ashley Hansgen of Sugar here, Sugar Hill, Georgia. That's right. Thank you so much. Alexi Marcou of Omaha, Nebraska, Dwayne Piper of Woodstock, Illinois, Tim Walsh of Macedon, New York, that's right, and finishing it out, Frederick Williams of Honolulu, Hawaii, there you go, shout out Hawaii, Richard Erskine of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and finally Kevin Sheehan of Campbell Hall, New York, top tier, top tier, and top tier, the last three there, there you go, all right guys. Thanks, lawbitingbiker.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. That's right. Pledge a certain amount per piece of content. No risk to you because you can put a monthly cap. There are benefits, stickers, T-shirts, getting that private Facebook group, access to those private video broadcasts and live chats up to access to our premium videos up on 
request, and we're blowing it up here in 2019, really ramping the patron thing up. And you guys know uh, all those top tier patrons, my new documentary film. I tried to act, uh, add an extra benefit there and get that to you guys free. Um, and of course, we're giving out coupon codes for the store and extra discounts for patrons. And it's all in that private Facebook group, mid level patrons and above. So we thank you guys so much for your continued support and uh, just could not do it without our beloved patrons. Don't forget, we got meetups coming. There's the patron only non sanctioned meetup event coming up. Get in that private Facebook group. We already did a podcast episode on that. And then the official sh- sanctioned uh, meetup. Um, later this year in Salt Lake City. You'll have to be involved as a patron to get all the details on that kind of stuff, and we'd love to meet up with you. Enough said. So here's the deal. You guys might find this interesting. And then we're going to get right into the interview. This is actually an interview with me, none other than than me. That's right. But it's specific to um, my other full-time job, and uh, that's a police uh, law enforcement motorcycle officer. That's what I do daily. Um, and then on my days off, and after hours, I hit law abiding biker media hard. You guys been following uh, for a long time. All know that about me and running a family too, a wife and two daughters. So this is all an inside look. Uh, it is an interview and, and of me. And I kind of get in a lot deeper about my position as a motors officer and what I do like, what I don't like, um, and a whole bunch of stuff in between. Anyways, how this came about is that's right. Law dog, none other than the LD right here at the law abiding biker podcast been so involved and helped me for so many years. Well, he decided he's going to uh, start a podcast. And so he reached out to me and, uh, I, he has helped me so much here at, at lab media. Um, and he's, and he's a brother, he's a true brother and, uh, and a super close friend. And, uh, I've been doing it for six years and I've learned all that there is. And there's, I'm still learning. I shouldn't say I learned all that there is, but about podcasting and the, the whole getting it going and the tech side and the things that have changed over the years, over the last six years. And I stay really in tuned to that. And of course he reached out to me and, uh, had a direct, uh, you know, someone that would help him, um, from the ground up. And he's done a ton of stuff on his own, but, um, I've lent him some equipment, extra equipment I've, I've had around. He purchased a lot of stuff. Anyways, I've been really helping him, um, in his mission to get up and going with his podcast as a resource. We text back and forth daily, um, he's up and running as of the time of this podcast. He'll have four episodes out when this releases. He'll probably have a whole bunch more, but he allowed me to use the audio file from that. I went to his house. He's in his garage and we got him all set up with his computer and his mixers and all that kind of stuff on a, on a table, card table at this point. It's pretty low key, but nonetheless, he's able to, to get going. He's in iTunes and Google podcasts and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're getting them out, out to the world. So, um, you know, a lot of you, the biker community, it's not necessarily a biker podcast that he's running. Um, it's a law enforcement specific podcast. Um, but of course it's open to the public. And so it might interest some of you. I don't know, uh, give it a listen, see if it's something that, you know, you want to key up and, and put in your, you know, your playlist. Um, but it is called the fine Lou, uh, excuse me, fine blue line podcast, and it's uh, by cops for cops, and it's all about law enforcement. And he's going strong, and I'm excited to see where he goes with it in the future. He will have a website eventually. It may be up by the time this airs, but it'll be the fine blue line podcast.com. But again, you can get the podcast in any of your favorite podcast aggregators. Um, it's there. So yeah, head over and uh, see, see, take a listen. If it's uh, something you're interested, kind of an inside look into law enforcement, he's doing a lot of great interviews. And of course, I think I was episode two. So the uh, interview you're going to hear with me is also, you know, over on his platform. Um, He released it. But again, I thought it would be interesting for you guys because I've never really been interviewed about my motors position. And uh, so uh, anyways, with that said, um, yeah, why don't we just dive in and uh, listen to the interview? We're good on the levels. All the levels are checked. The gainers are set. The gainers are set. Gainer, gainer, gainer. Oh, yeah. You're completely Fuck. unprofessional. 
I'll just tell you that right now. That's fine. It's supposed to be a professional Leo podcast, and not you're completely at all. unprofessional, Who, dude. Whoever said this was going to be professional? Dude, I'm just over here sitting as a guest. This is so sweet. I was waiting for my time after six years, dude, to just be a guest and watch somebody else over here stress out over all the tech stuff, dude. This is really nice. This I, I don't stress really, so I don't give a shit. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Blue Line Podcast, two cops, from cops, for cops, where we discuss issues, trends, products, and so much more. Okay, today we're going to talk about being a motors officer, and we have a guest with us today. I'm going to let him introduce himself, so go ahead, buddy. Yeah, Ryan Erlacher is the name. Um, how much you want me to tell him about, about myself, brother? As much as you're willing to share. All right, so... Uh, I guess uh, we're specifically to law enforcement. I've uh, been in Leo for 24 years now. Um, three different departments, so I uh, have uh, a little bit of diversity there and seeing how different things work. Um, I've had a lot of different assignments, uh, everything from uh, narcotics canine uh, detection handler, trainer to street crimes. I worked on a federal task force for a while, and then uh, a lot of stuff in between, of course, in 24 years. But current assignment which I think is our topic today, is a current assignment for the last several years is a uh, full-time motorcycle officer in a motors unit. So there's a little bit of background. And not just uh, assigned to the unit, but you're also a trainer as well. Is that correct? I am. I am. So we can we can uh, dive into that a little bit too as, as we get deeper into the episode if you want to hear a little bit about, about that. But yes, I am the only trainer uh, currently for our unit, which is a unit of, uh, well, we have, we're down to five in a hundred, uh, I guess our department's a municipality uh, of about 150. I think we're lowering that right now, but somewhere around there. So uh, five of us. Sounds good. And then do you do anything other than work as motors officer? Uh, r- right now I uh, am um, uh, technically part-time firearms instructor. Uh, so I, I have that responsibility, but that's pretty much... Uh, I had some other irons in the fire, and I dumped all those. I kind of niched down, um, uh, niched down to just being the trainer and doing that. At this point in my career, uh, I'm happy with that, and uh, I've got enough to do because uh, I run a full time side business, and uh, that keeps me plenty busy, t- busy too. So let's hear about that. Okay, so a lot of you uh, may come over to this podcast, but uh, uh, run law abiding biker media. It's lawabidingbiker.com. Um, and I don't want to plug my stuff too much. This is your podcast, but it gives you a little bit of background. Um, Rob here, your host, uh, has been, uh, this isn't his first time on a microphone. He's been on my podcast, uh, started it six years ago. It's the Law Abiding Biker podcast. If you guys are interested, it's all about, um, I know a lot of officers out there ride motorcycles and, uh, you know, to get away, it's kind of our shrink, so to speak. I spend my money on that instead of a shrink. Um, and it, it does much better for me anyways. But, uh, um, we started that Law Abiding Biker podcast uh, six years ago. It's all about motorcycling, motorcycling uh, 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 trends, news, maintenance. Um, it's fairly Harley-centric, but I wouldn't say that anymore uh, so much as um, we're really about anybody and whatever you ride. It's just that a lot of us own Harleys, so we tend to go down that rabbit hole sometimes, but it's open to all bikers and uh, everything you want to know. I think we're a little over 200 episodes now after six years and a very popular YouTube channel too. Um, so that's my side business. We run a motorcycle, so I won't go uh, any deeper than that. But if you want to learn any more about that, it's lawabidingbiker.com. And from there, you can find out everything that we do. All right. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about your current assignment. So you're a motors officer and instructor. So in your department, what hours do you guys work? Okay. So, uh, we're trying to get tens right now. (laughs) That's an interesting subject. Uh, but Right now, I work nine, so nine-hour shifts, and we stagger um, between, so we have some guys come out seven to four, and then uh, two of us come out at nine to six, and uh, one more a full complement, we have a 10 to seven. Of course, we have a sergeant um, that runs the unit. He works, you know, different hours depending on the needs there, but we work Monday through Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday off, every other Monday off is how that works with a nine-hour shift so that we get the appropriate amount of hours. So, um, yeah, so every every other week is a, a, a three-day weekend, but we are currently working on, uh, we would like to go to 10s. It just would be a little bit better for the family life and things like that. It's kind of a tough shift. 
Yeah, for sure. We've got a couple guys on 99s over the years that have worked that at my department. Uh, what kind of bike do you ride? Okay, so um, that's an interesting subject, too. I don't know where you want to go with this stuff, so... Um, because I'm used to talking on a mic, I can talk forever. So if you need to, if you don't want to go down that rabbit hole, just tell me. Um, but a couple things on that. So, uh, and I know these are some of the questions that uh, people have out there, and maybe you know law enforcement officers listening. Um, so that's why I'm going to uh, expand on this. But shut me down if you need to, dude. It's your show. I will. I'll mute your mic. This is the first time. If you guys didn't know, um, this is the first time I've I've been a I've been interviewed before, but it's my first time as a guest. I've been running the show at Law Abiding Biker Media for six years now, and I'm always in the captain's chair running everything. So it's kind of refreshing to sit over here and cross my leg and just drink a beer and be asked questions. But because of that, I don't want to steal Robbie's thunder here and steal the show. So back to that question. We ride Harley Davidson motorcycles. Uh, Electroglides is the base model. Uh, my current ride is a 2018 uh, Harley-Davidson Electroglide with a Milwaukee 8 motor. That's the newest motor put out by Harley-Davidson back in uh, 2017. And I think our oldest bike on the fleet is a couple years older than that. But we're pretty much all, by the end of 2019, will be upgraded uh, to the new Milwaukee 8 uh, motor and all that. Something that comes up, it might be a good question, Rob, is, um, you know, a lot of you, you always get that, and you know that just being a, a Harley rider yourself and involved with law abiding biker media. Uh, you always get the you know, Harley versus BMW, you know, whole spiel. And people are always asking, you know, especially the public, you know, is that a Harley? Is that a Harley? You know, or what do you ride? What are you riding? I'll sum that up. So, the problem is, I won't say it's a problem, but um, by far. And there's some reasons, and I'll give you some reasons for this that, that I believe. By far, the number one used motorcycle, uh, and I love all motorcycles, so I'm not bashing any motorcycle. I would, I'll ride whatever they pay me to ride, honestly. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, I'm getting paid to ride a motorcycle every day, and I'm cool with that. I would rather have a Harley, and I'll tell you in a minute. I'm not a Harley snob. I'll just tell you why, and uh, you can either agree or disagree with me. Um, hopefully, you'll have some comments on the website. People can leave some comments on the website. Uh, For sure. Reference this show. So, tell me what, tell us what you think. But uh, by far, in the United States, the Harley-Davidson police motorcycle is still the number one used police motorcycle. Um, we're very, uh, here in the Northwest, it's very jaded um, because you see a lot more metric here in the Northwest uh, portion of the United States. Why is that? I don't know. It's, and I've been asked that question. I don't exactly know um, why. I think it kind of, you know, in law enforcement, as you know, trends get set. And so one department sees that... Um, I do know one reason. Oftentimes, chiefs look at, they don't look at what's best. Uh, command staff, um, they look at what's cheapest, right? And so they go for the low bid. And the problem is, uh, you know, a lot of departments, you can go out and get, you know, for the price of a Harley, you can get, you know, one and a half BMWs or two Hondas. And so they're a, a bit more expensive. They don't look at the quality and they don't do research into what kind of motorcycle lasts for law enforcement use because we abuse the, the shit out of them, um, uh, so to speak, the way that we ride these bikes. Um, but one reason would be price. But then you know how it is when a uh, chief buys BMWs and then they go to the the uh, police chief's conferences and they're like, hey, what'd you do with your motorcycle? Oh, dude, we, we straight up went BMW. You get two for the price of one, you know, and blah, blah. And that chief's like, oh, shit, I'm doing that. You know, you know how it is. Um, and I think all our listeners who are involved in law enforcement clearly know that that's how it works sometimes. Almost never with the end user in mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well said, dude. Well said. And that's a fine tasting uh, space dust IPA, by the, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, that'll keep my uh, uh, whistle wet here. Uh, so, and so those are some of the reasons, uh, but by far, uh, Hardy Davidson, if you, if you, so the Northwest is jaded. So you come up here and you see that a lot. Um, and when we go to uh, conferences, motorcycle training uh, conferences and things like that, by far, we're outnumbered here. But if you move east, if you move east, you will f quickly, quickly find that it's rare, um, a lot more rare that you see a metric motorcycle used in law enforcement. Now, let me uh, uh, spin off that a little bit. Which is better, um, you know, if you're listening or maybe you're listening and you're in command staff or you guys are thinking about your department. Um, 
I will tell you, there's nothing wrong with the BMWs. Um, I would st- steer away from Hondas. Uh, they just don't handle the abuse. A lot of people are getting away from the Honda STs. And your department has some experience with, you had Hondas do. prior to the Harleys, right? Yeah, good call. Uh, well, we had Harleys forever. And then at some point, they decided, like I just said, that they were going to save some money and go low bid. And they went with two Honda STs, 1300s, I believe they are. And within two years, they're like, we're done. And they just couldn't handle the abuse. Um, they were breaking. Uh, it was really expensive to replace the clutches, and we need to replace the clutches a lot more often than an average rider, just the way that we ride these bikes. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the cone work and low speed and all that kind of stuff. So they went back to Harleys, and a lot of departments have done that. Um, and we sold our uh, uh, Hondas off to a county agency to get their program uh, start, started up. Um, it was a good start for them. So... Um, so we went back to the Hardy. So that was a very, very short time. Um, but the BMWs, a uh, good bike. I have nothing wrong with them. Um, just not comfortable for long distance. It's a, it's a mid control, uh, setup and you know, the Hardys, the Hardys are just tanks. Let me just be straight. You can, uh, when I train new guys and I've uh, trained uh, recently last year at a school in the Spokane, Washington area, we did a motor school. If you and I put those videos up uh, again, I'm not trying to plug my stuff, but if you're interested more in this, I did a, a four part vlog series while I was instructing a two week motorcycle school. Those videos have got tons of hits. Uh, again, just look for the Law Abiding Biker YouTube channel, but it's a good insight into what I'm talking about here if you want to watch those videos. But the way that these bikes get trashed and go down, the Harleys just freaking handle it like they don't break like you can i've seen people do wheelies and dump hardies and over and over they're made of metal they're hardy they're a lot heavier again i'm not dogging the bmw it's a great bike so don't don't think that i'm doing that a harley snob the my other and i don't know if who will agree with me out there necessarily i'm a little bit because i've been in law enforcement 24 years i'm a little bit more traditional in some aspects not all aspects but I just believe that for uh, in a motors unit, um, I'll tell you this, if you're going to get in a motors unit, it's one of the my, most high profile public relations tool that a department can have. And the chief, smart chiefs that know that keep their motorcycle units around for that reason. We are so, we're in the schools, we're out there in the, you know, our department wears the traditional motor knee high motor boots, you know, um, and all that kind of stuff on the shiny Harley Davidson. There is just something about running a funeral or escort parades when you see Harley Davidson Electroglide with those windshields. It's what you see in the presidential escorts, right? When you know the right. Kennedy, you know, use Kennedy assassination, right? You see, there's Harley's running all the. It's just to me, it is such a beautiful. It's got tons. You know, the BMWs they don't have any chrome. They, they're just not flashy, and that's okay. They're great running machines. But I believe from a public relations standpoint, um, the Harleys are just so beautiful and just draw something from our past here in the United States. And you see all those old, you can see it right now, how visualized black and white videos. And you just, the Harleys have been used for so long in law enforcement. Um, I will tell you this, riding the Hondas for a little bit, nobody comes up to you at a stoplight and says, oh, that's a beautiful machine. And it's not that it's not beautiful. It's just people stop us all the time. Kids want to come up. The shiny chrome at the fairs, you know, when we go, kids want to see it. They're just people aren't, uh, the BMW is just kind of blah. It's a great runner machine, but it's just blah. It doesn't catch the eye. It's not flashy. We wax those Harleys up. And so when you go to an event and you look like that, it just, it draws something from the public that I've seen that's different than the BMWs do. Um, so anyways, again, I'm not trashing them uh, at all. I hope you know that. I hope I've been clear about that. You no, know, that's great insight as far as the public, uh, perception piece. I hadn't thought of that. So that's excellent. Um, I just want to touch real quick. You said we're from the Northwest. We are from Washington state and weather restrictions on your bike. What do you, does your department impose those? Is that your option or how does that work? Yeah. So that's an interesting point. So if you're not familiar with, we're in Eastern Washington, I'll say that first, don't, if you're listening from abroad, which you probably are, um, I want you to split Washington into two sections, okay? Because a lot of people think, um, you know, Seattle and the rain, and you guys get rain on all the time. Okay, so Western Washington, west of the Cascade Mountain Range, Seattle, yes, they get dumped on. They have full-time motors units over there, and they ride pretty much year-round in the pouring rain. 
Um, I just saw him over there in December when I was over there working uh, traffic detail, pouring down rain in Bellevue. Um, they don't get a lot of ice and snow, so they're good. Over here in eastern Washington, east of the Cascades, we're a desert. We get less than two inches of rain a year. Yes, Washington State, we get less than two inches of rain a year. And because everybody thinks we're Seattle, we're not. We're two hours and 15 minutes east of Seattle. Unless you drive like Rob, you're about an hour and a half. I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, we're two hours and 15 minutes away. So here we are in the desert. So we get extreme summers, triple digits. Um, we get all four seasons in the extreme. Um, and then we get uh, winter sometimes in the extreme, although this winter has been pretty mild. So to open that up, um, we do have times where we can't ride due to ice and snow. So one of our general rules is, and, and I don't necessarily, we don't always follow that rule just because coldness depends on moisture. So if it's 32 degrees or below, I've ridden in, I've ridden full days and <laughs> it gets kind of, those days are long, but you know, below freezing, but it's not moist out. And so there's no frost on the road, you know, it's a dry type cold, you know, we'll ride in that. Um, but what happens is we don't get to bring a car or a motorcycle home with us. We have take home vehicles in our department. Everybody has a take home vehicle. Ours is a motorcycle when we're on the motorcycle. Ours is a car when we transition to a car. So the problem you run into is the, the, you know, Thursday was you went in and it was below freezing, but it was a nice dry cold and the sun was still out. But then you wake up the next morning and there's frost and ice on car windshields. And so I've got to drive from the country into the city. And so that becomes sketchy. So there does become a point um, this year, kind of at the end of November, it started getting a lot of frost. And although we haven't had a lot of snow, um, uh, we we tend to put them away for a little while when we aren't able to to really know whether it's going to be icy or not. Um, th- and that's just smart business, you know. Um, not a fan of putting it away. I'm a hardcore rider. I signed up to be a motorcycle officer and I ride, we ride in triple digits. We ride in, in uh, double, you know, digits below freezing. Um, and we could go into some of that too, uh, in a little bit, if you wanted to run the gear rabbit hole and some of the things that I do, but I'll let you decide if that's uh, something you want to do. So about, you know, the, I hope that doesn't muddy it too much, but, um, yeah, obviously snow, ice, uh, regardless of temperature, we got to put them up for safety. Excellent. Excellent. And what is your favorite part of being a motors officer? Favorite part of the assignment? Oh boy. I didn't see any of these questions before he asked. Um, it's not that I don't know an answer. It's that I have a lot of answers, uh, that I could, uh, uh, do on that. So I think Rob, the number one for me, um, obviously because I run law abiding biker media, motorcycle, complete, uh, motorcycle, uh, related website and, and all that. Um, it's the riding the motorcycle, uh, because I rode off duty so much that I told you freeze the soul. It's my shrink. Um, the fact that I, I did a lot of assignments in my career and you'll hear this. Um, I, I, I see, I just love BS and like this cause I can, I hope I'm not, am I okay? You're doing Getting great. Off track. Doing great. No, yeah. keep it going. I, okay. I like the, the dialogue and the interaction. I think, uh, when I listen to podcasts sometimes that are a sole person, right? it just bores me sometimes. So no, go ahead. You're, okay. You're rolling. Cause I can just, you know me, I've talked on a mic for so many years now. I have, I, I just, I can keep talking. Um, so riding the motorcycle is big to me. The fact that I've done all these different assignments, you'll talk to many motorcycle officers. If you have some in your department, just ask them. We have some that are ex motorcycle officers that got out and are now lieutenants, captains, sit down with them. Um, in their office, crack a beer, whatever it is, not in the office away from the department, but um, I'm sure everybody has policies against that. Now, back in the day, see, I could go down. Okay, so 24 years. Um, uh, but you, you ask any motorcycle officer who is a previous motorcycle officer, and they will tell you, I haven't found one. By far, they will tell you, I should have never left that position. By far, it was the most rewarding. If you're into motorcycles, now that's not going to be everybody. I'm talking about a previous motorcycle officer is going to tell you it's the best assignment that I've ever had. Like it was the most rewarding assignment that I've ever had. And I've done a lot of stuff. I told you street crimes, narcotics, canine. I have some great stories and rewarding moments in my career um, that the task force, all that. But by far, I'll tell you, 
that they told me that before. And I don't know why I waited so long. I needed to do other things in my career. Everybody has their things that they need to do. And I just felt like those were things that was always available to me to apply for it. I just kind of waited. I was riding off duty, law abiding biker media, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, at this point in my career, I was like, yep, uh, I got, I got to sign up for that. And I will tell you that absolutely, Rob, I get paid and it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, right? It's law enforcement. It's government. It's a, it's a shit show most of the time. Right. Um, but by far, if I'm going to be in that environment at this point in my career, I can't think of a better thing to do than get up every morning and be able to jump on a Hardy Davidson motorcycle and ride into work, just the ride to work and back alone. And I'm getting paid for it before I wasn't getting paid for it. Well, I know why you waited so long. You waited until electronic ticketing came out. <laughs> no doubt, dude. Yeah, no doubt, dude. It is a lot easier, dude, with Sector, for sure. That's what we run here in Washington State. I don't know if that's a national thing, but... Um, I don't th- I think that's a, a it is computer Washington. program. So I think it's Washington, yeah. It is. Um, yeah, electronic. So um, that's, probably, that, that's probably the best of just writing. Second, and I'll stop at second. Um, the other thing that intermingles, and we've already talked about a little bit, so I'll piggyback off that, is the public relations part of that. I really, really enjoy um, mingling with the public. We go to coffee shops because our office is offices away from offices. We don't, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, go ahead. Go I'm, ahead. I'm over shaking my head. Oh, Bus yeah, motors guys, motors guys are at the coffee shop. That's surprising. Pretty much if you see us there. No, they encourage us to. I'll tell you why. Um, we have a smart administration when it comes out. In fact, one of our captains at my agency was a pre- prior motors officer, and he is our captain for our division. So um, he wants us hanging on there. We are working. You know, we take our laptops. We have to catch up on collision reports and tickets and all that kind of stuff. We have uh, hit and run investigations we're following up on, but that we have to get out of the heat. We have to get out of the cold. You can't do it all from your motorcycle, stand there for hours. So he wants us in there, and that's my second part to it is the public relations part. I really enjoy that part. Um, for some reason, I was in regular uniform um, for a long time, and I went to coffee shops, and I went to restaurants and stuff. Yes, people come up and talk to you, but I will tell you by far, Rob, that there is way more people. For some reason, I think it's a lot with the traditional uniform we wear, too. They see the bikes parked out front. They see us in the knee-high leather boots. We look different than all cops, don't we? We don't look like a regular police officer. We have very unique uniforms, um, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and they see the bikes, like I say, out front. And so these people just come up and they want to talk to you. They we're at all the public uh, community events and parades and things like that. The kids, the parents. And so that's my second part to that is at this point in my career, I just really enjoy that positive interaction with the public, um, with those public relation type events that I just talked about. That's probably just as rewarding to me as getting to ride a motorcycle every day. So yeah, there you go. That's probably those two. All right, so I've known you for a while, so I know you had a pretty good handle going into this thing, but were there any expectations or surprises going into that assignment from what you uh, thought? Mm, Good question, and that's going to be a fairly quick answer on that, Rob, only because I will tell you that it took me five years to get into my current position. Um, I had to apply. It's limited. If you think about it, we only got uh, uh, four full-time and a a full-time sergeant, so you got five guys and a a 150-man, you know, technically department when you're at full staffing somewhere around there. So it wasn't easy to get in. And the guys that get in are in for a long time. I hope to retire in this position. So, you know, maybe one position's open or something like that. So um, I will tell you that I was already training and I already went, they sent me to motor school. Uh, I begged so, so much and applied so much that they sent me through motor school um, two years before I even got my full-time position. And so I was already going out and work in special events with them. I just wasn't day-to-day full-time. So I can tell you that I did my research and I knew what I was getting into. And I already ride motorcycles off duty hardcore. You know that. Me and you ride cross country thousands of miles together. Um, so it was, I can say there's zero surprises when I got in that unit um, about, uh, uh, you know, I knew what to expect, I guess. So, so no, no, no big surprises. Yeah. There would be to a lot of people. Yeah. I figured that was going to be the answer. Um, what is your least favorite part about working in motors? I can piggyback off that a little bit too, because it's an answer I already gave. Um, I, I would say that putting the bike away, I hate, um, having to get back in a cage 
uh, a car. If you guys aren't familiar with motorcycle terms, we call them cages, uh, straight leggers we call. So the straight leggers, like when we're doing events, um, see, I can just go on this stuff. So when we're doing events or we're having briefings, we always have to, you know, we have very specific ways, um, which we could get into later about how we operate. Cause, um, by far, God, see, there's another one. You might write, I don't know if you have notes. I always, uh, I got notes. I'm ready. Yeah. Um, dangerous, dangerous position. Um, escorts, extremely dangerous. Um, but we have very specific ways that we do things. And, uh, we always, that's what we call the regular guys out there. Not as a put down, but they're straight leggers. Cause they've got the straight leg pants and all that kind of stuff instead of the breeches. So, um, I hate getting back in that. I hate getting back in a car. Um, I live, eat, and breathe motorcycles, and I feel so much better during the day when I ride a motorcycle. The other guys on the unit will tell you that too, because um, that's the funny thing too. A lot, a lot of the guys uh, on my motorcycle unit aren't really motorcycle guys. Really? Only on duty. Yeah. So it's interesting. You think were they before getting into the unit or no? No, no. Seriously, um, I think only one. Um, so. It's funny, they got into it and they're motorcycle guys on duty, but they don't ride off duty, don't care about anything else except riding on duty. So, uh, so I, that, what, I, I, I went down that, that, well, what, you were start, starting to talk about the, the straight leggers and the cages. Oh, the straight leggers, yeah. And, and then I, so I you guess hate, you hate getting into the car. Yeah, that was the question. I hate, I hate getting back in the car. So that's the one thing I hate about it the most. Um, I feel so much more energetic during the day. They'll tell you that too. Just because you're on a bike, you're in the fresh air. It's actually a physical, uh, you're a lot more physical during the day when you're kickstanding and unkickstanding every traffic stop, um, just maneuvering the bike. Um, there's a lot of uh, physical uh, to it. And so you feel so much more alive. And, you know, sitting in a car like I am now because it snowed, um, you know, sitting in a car, I just, you get lethargic and uh, you just were up and off that bike all the time and just that fresh air and all that kind of stuff. You just feel, mm, I do. It's it's uh it's something in me. It's uh, it's something you you have to um you have to really want. I wouldn't recommend being a motorcycle officer for very many officers that I know, and that, I don't mean that in a bad way. And most officers listening right now, even in my department, they look at us and they're like, "Dude, there is no." When they pull up to me in the summer in 110, 108 degree weather, they just look at us like, "Are you fucking crazy, dude?" Right? You know, they're like, "I would never." do that like why would somebody choose so you have to have it in your heart um and because it's in my heart um you know just uh to to have that feeling um when i'm not in a motorcycle to get back in that car it just reminds me that how much i enjoy being on that motorcycle excellent and uh, my next question was how many motors officers in your department we already covered that so i want to go over some training so how long um were you riding before you went into the unit mm. so i've been riding motorcycles my first motorcycle was in high school um, when I was a senior, so I was 17. Um, I got my first street bike. And then I had that, and I dabbled a little bit. And then it seems like, Rob, in back, I kind of skipped my 20s, and I had those dreams of anybody who's been a motorcyclist. I didn't have a bike for a while, and I literally would have these dreams of this freedom of riding, and I'd wake up and go, God, i got to get another bike. And So I, got, I think I got back into it in my 30s, and uh, ever since just been going strong, um, realized that it is a deep part and a deep need I have. Um, like I said, I don't say that jokingly. Everybody's got their way to get away um, from law enforcement. We have to do that. You're an experienced Leo. You know, you guys have to, everybody early in their career, you have to. It's been the best thing for me um, uh, to have, you know, a side business and hobbies and ride motorcycles. It literally, when I say it's my shrink, that's not a joke. Like, I'll just straight up stressful day. Um, even when I ride motorcycle all day now, Sometimes it's a different type of riding. I'll come home, jump on my street bike, and I'll run up, uh, you know, behind my house up the River Canyon uh, and stuff like that. Um, that has been the one of the greatest things for my soul, you know, and my spirit um, when I get stressed, so to speak, just to jump on that bike and ride. So, um, yeah, I'm answer. I'm not in motors, but I do the same thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll come home some days and just jump on the bike and go for an hour or two. And it totally relieves you, doesn't it? There's yeah, something to sure. that. Yeah. Um, so we talked so about riding experience. Is yeah. That, did so, I cover that pretty good? Yeah. Good yeah. enough. All right. So All right. you skipped your twenties. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I kind of skipped my twenties. Yeah. Yeah. I did. So you do have some riding experience prior that wasn't law enforcement. So did that hurt or help you? Do you think when you decided to become a motors officer? I think in my case, Rob, and I don't want to sound arrogant here, um, at the risk of sounding arrogant. Um, I think it helped me, um, a lot. Because I was an aggressive rider within reason too. I just that have that personality. Me and you are a lot alike, which is why we both we've talked about in the past why we both have 
you know, this, you have a side podcast, I have a, a podcast and a YouTube channel and a business. We're just very, very driven people. So I didn't mess around. I didn't just get on a motorcycle and want to learn how to ride it half ass. I was already doing things and watching videos and trying to take myself as a as a citizen rider to the next level. And so because I, I tell you, it will hurt a lot of people. It hurts a lot of people to have because they got bad habits. It's kind of like teaching a new firearms guy who's said, I grew up hunting. My dad and grandpa taught me out on the farm how to shoot. You're like, oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> this guy's got so many bad habits. You know, not always the case and not always the case in motors. You got a question. Yeah. So uh, my next question actually I have written down here is, is type of riding motors versus pleasure because you said you wanted to take it to the next level you wanted to be the best citizen rider you could what's the difference what what uh for, say your general rider is out riding their bike on on saturday and sunday and then they decide to go into motors what's the biggest difference between the two types of riding okay so if you guys get on and if you get on uh the youtube videos i already mentioned uh earlier in this episode and watch that motor school the way citizens ride most citizens now there are some that push themselves and there are schools um We've had those questions over at the Law Abiding Biker pad Podcast over the years. There are schools and ex-motors uh, officers. I, it's hard to put in a nutshell, other than the, the you're going uh, uh, from a citizen rider who's just out. It's not hard to get on a motorcycle, and you know, and just shift and go down the road, a highway, and just completely take it easy. You know what I mean? So here's the difference. Um, and that's not necessarily... That's dangerous. A lot of people just get on a motorcycle and they're like, I don't ever want to get better. They think they're good enough. You can never be good enough. It's your life uh, that you're taking into your hands every time you get on a motorcycle. Simple things like threshold braking and emergency braking and emergency maneuvers. You don't get a second chance many times on a motorcycle. You'll either be maimed or killed. So you have to take it so seriously. And I wish more citizens would take it seriously. Um, yeah. Another thing on that is... Uh that I've noticed just talking with other citizens that ride and such is they'll ride, like you said, on, on Saturday and Sunday, they think they're good enough, but as their life progresses and they get newer bikes or whatever, the technology changes and you've got to keep up with that as a rider going from non ABS to ABS is a huge change in the motorcycle world. And if you're not up to how that operates and you test it, most guys will never test it. Oh, I have ABS now. It's supposed to be great until they use it. <laughs> Correct. And so going out and testing your bike, putting it through the paces, I mean, that's an important part of riding, even if you're a motors officer or not. Yep. Yeah, good points, dude. Good points. And just, you know, how many guys have went out um, and just did threshold braking? You know, I mean, guy, you got to. That'll save your life more than anything. As an instructor, I teach my guys. Um, I try to do that all the time is threshold braking. The more speed, the quicker you can dump, even if you're going to impact, the more survivability you have. But... So one of the main things, just to put that in a, try to put that in some sort of neat package here, is citizens ride sloppily, most of them, lazily. They aren't on their game. They don't think it's going to happen to them. They haven't practiced any of the things I talk about. Um, you know, we're in an environment where the, most citizens, they'd watch us. They can't believe we can do what we do with our bikes. You know, a Harley should not do the things that we do with it. Um, it really wasn't designed for what we do with it. Um, but because, you know, Everything and in, in being a, a motorcycle officer and as an instructor is, um, you know, brake throttle, uh, brake throttle clutch balance um, is, is what it is. And there's a fine symphony that goes on between all those things when you learn it and it takes a long time and it's a completely diminishing skill. But we're in an environment where we are doing, um, we're, we're pulling out to chase cars in a city environment with cross intersections everywhere. We're running lights and siren. Now, try that in a patrol car, of course. Everybody listening, if you're a Leo, have. Um, that's one thing. Get your get your ass on a Harley-Davidson and blow an intersection, okay? You got to be on your game because if you get hit in a car, you might be okay. You get hit on a motorcycle, we know you, you die um, at those kind of speeds. So we're doing maneuvers. We're having to get in and out. We're having to split traffic. We're having to turn on cars. All of a sudden, you see a car go the opposite direction. Um, you know, you see civilian motorcycles, they can have a four lane road and they're dragging their feet, trying to turn a U-turn. We can, we can do a U-turn in a, you know, 15, 16 foot lane in one lane. And so you don't always have four lanes. And so on a two lane County road, we got to be able to ditches on both sides. We got to be able to lay those things down, bar lock them. And we've got to be able to not dump it and turn around, you know. It'd be real embarrassing if you dumped it trying to it go happens. catch the guy after the fact. It happens. You want to know what happens when you dump a bike? 
Hey, Bikeaholics, searching for new and exciting motorcycle products? Zero 3D has just what you're looking for. Check out their wide variety of innovative products for Harley Davidson and Honda Goldwing motorcycles. Zero 3D's got your back with chrome, black parts, lighting, and other comfort products. No modifying, cutting, grinding, or welding for an easy installation. Mm hmm. That equals less time installing, more time riding. Zero 3D has a design team with over 40 years' experience with a passion for design and innovation. Can bus made simple with plug and play lighting systems. They pride themselves on great customer service. Got a question? Get in touch with them. Sales at Zero3D.com. Give them a call. 715 808 0027. Check at your local Harley or Honda dealership and ask for Zero or Gold Strike parts. A new leader has emerged, Bikeaholics, so check out Zero 3D's custom line of Gold Strike products for Honda Goldwings. Help support us right here. Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store and check out our full line of Zero 3D products. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, a guy like me pulls up in his patrol car and points and laughs. And you correct that too. Yeah, yeah, that, that happens too. Uh, you will dump a bike in public. Everybody has. Hopefully not a lot of people see you, but the, w- the extremes we're doing on those, that's the other thing we get guys over the fear of dumping them. It doesn't happen often once you're an experienced uh, motors officer, but in training, you dump them all the time because you're pushing yourself to the next level. But here's our motors unit deal, and a lot of motors units follow this. So we call it dirty wings. So we wear the motorcycle wings. You know, motorcycle officers, we have the motorcycle wheel and wings. Um, it's a self-reporting system, okay? So, yeah, and it gets better. Let me take a sip here. I think people will find this funny. That's why I'm telling the story. I think these are funny stuff. But um, So if, if you dump a motorcycle, whether it's just, sometimes you're just in a hurry and you forget to put a kickstand down, I mean, or you stop and there's gravel and your foot slips out, sh- shit's going to happen. It's no big deal. You pick your, we know how to pick, you pick them back up and you ride on. But nonetheless, it's a funny game. So if you self-report, which you should. I always self-report. I've only done it once, I think, um, since I've been out. But you self-report to the unit and you get dirty wings. You have to turn your wings upside down and on your uniform and you wear them upside down until um, for 30 days or until the next guy dumps his and self-reports. So um, if you don't self-report, um, then uh, you, you know, go, what, I'm trying to think if you don't self-report, you got to wear them for like 60 days. I, I'm trying to think because all our guys self-report. But So we had... I remember, though, we had one guy do it, and he didn't self-report. And so people get concerned, P- citizens. You know, they see a motorcycle officer. It's no big deal. You just dump a bike, and then you pick it back up. But citizens are like, oh, my God. Oh. You know, we're like, yeah, <laughs> shit happens all the time. Citizens will call and go, the sergeant, hey, is that motorcycle officer okay? I saw him drop his bike when he was doing a turn. And the sergeant's like, aha, didn't self-report, dude. I'm trying to remember now because nobody's did that in a while. There's another penalty. I, I don't know if it's beer or whatever, dude, but there is an extra penalty for not self-reporting. So anyways, that's the game we play, but uh, it will happen. Nowadays, everyone's watching. I, mean, oh, you got, you're in, I self-report, just, dude. Nobody would have saw me, dude, but I'm telling you, I just called. I texted everybody right away. I go, dirty wings, and, and they all know what that means, and everybody wants to hear the story. Mine was insignificant. I was in a driveway setting up for laser, and it was on an incline, and it's where I always set up. But I just, there was a little bit of gravel and my foot slipped and you just let your bike go. We don't try to hold them. You just let them go because you'll hurt yourself trying to hold them. Just let it dump and then you pick it back up. But I let her dump and sure enough, I texted right away, self-reported. It was a, it was three days later that another guy did it. So I only had to ride, ride around dirty for three days, dude. You don't want to run the risk and not get, not, uh, nope, nope. waiting too long and then somebody c- catches you. you exactly. Know, what's the, what's, the, what's That's the, worse because you, you have to save face in front of your unit. Like seriously, dude, you didn't self-report. Seriously. What's the time frame? You got, like, what? you got like five minutes to report or what? No, immediately. <laughs> There's no, you better just get on group text, dude, and just say that stuff right away, man. Yeah. Someone beat you to it. That's the, that's the time frame. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you rode before and then you had, had trained prior to going into the unit. How long before you felt pretty comfortable? Was that a right away thing or? Uh, comfortable on the street or? Yeah. R- riding on the street. It's just in your day to day duties. Yeah. I'll tell you. Um, there's so much. If you think back to when you were first a police officer, you get in that car and you've got lights and you've got a siren and you've got spotlights and you've got radios and a computer and MDT and all this kind of stuff. Now get on a motorcycle, take your street motorcycle and put all that shit on your motorcycle, bro. And you and you don't have available hands because they're on the control clusters. But while you're trying to clutch, 
you're trying to push your radio, dude. And you're trying to let your clutch out a little bit because they're pulling into a parking lot. And you're trying to push the button with your thumb and let out on your clutch because the radio side's on the left side or your PA and you're trying to clutch and brake and you've got light controls or it's a, it's a mess. It's a mess. And that's something you really can't teach people. We try to in motor school, we give them a little experience with that until you just get out on the street. So I felt comfortable with riding. Uh, again, without being arrogant, I was, I felt like I was a really good rider and I qualified. Um, I take that stuff really serious and I practice a lot. I practice generally speaking much more, I would say than, than most, even though I'm an instructor, I just, I, 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 I'm a perfectionist and I have to, and I run really fast times. Um, I just, I like competing. Um, so I was very comfortable with the writing aspect of it, but with the lights and radio and the way I was going to conduct business and I've, I'm still learning stuff now. And then you find little tricks, like think about this, bro, things people don't think about when you're running on a motorcycle. So take your personal bike. Now the other guy, um, goes and turns and you're stopping him and he goes down a hill with an incline like this and you're on a bike, dude. Or the incline, you know what I'm talking about, is is to the right, and you put your kickstand down, and your bike won't even stand. Yeah. You got to learn how to turn your bike into the incline. There's all kinds of shit that you'll just sometimes when you're first starting, you just stop. You're like, oh shit, yeah, yeah. What do I do here? <laughs> you you got to think about yeah, it. Yeah, hopefully this isn't a real bad guy. You know, you're just like, uh, okay, that was a shitty position, and you try to back your bike up. So. You know, getting comfortable with that stuff, I would say, takes about a year. Now I'm just super. I don't even think about it. I can do it in my sleep just like you do in a patrol car. Um, but if you're not really confident Ho- hopefully, riding. Hopefully not in my sleep, but go ahead. Right, well, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> probably, dude. You're on graveyards. I'm just saying. Guarantee you fell asleep before. Uh, he, won't, he won't admit it on this microphone because it's against department policy, but I guarantee everybody listening out there on graveyards has at some point. So in 13, don't even lie, you no, listeners, in, right now. Don't even lie. In 13 years, I've never slept in my car. Really? I I know ever never once. I have gone in the office and said, that, well, that's what, okay. Sarge, I'm taking my lunch I shouldn't break. say car. I shouldn't say car. In the office and and put your head at the at the squad table, put um, your head down. I, I shouldn't say car so, necessarily. Just so everybody knows, Ryan and I are from different departments, but we actually have in our policy that our sergeant can order us to sleep on duty. Mm. If we have court the next day or something, we he can actually he can actually for up to half our shift order us home on duty to sleep for court. Really, dude? Yeah. I like that policy, dude. Um, yeah, it's completely against department policy to sleep in your car. So, but I'm just saying, uh, you're right, dangerous office, it is dangerous. It's, it, well, it's one of the, you know, it's one of the fatal errors. Um, so we joke about it, but yeah, I have slept in the office and stuff before, um, just because, yeah, if you're sick or whatever, but all right. So does that answer, uh, when that? you're comfortable? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I th- and if you're not comfortable with riding it, you know, as a motors officer, some of our guys, it's taken a lot more time than that. So Um, yeah, just, it depends on each person. Just, uh, and, uh, I've seen this in the past and I think that you guys have a really cool setup, but, uh, um, seriously, dude, rifle on the bike. Sorry, dude. That's a podcast one on one, dude. Turn your dang. No, I'm just teasing. It's all right. It's just coming through. My my kids text me. People are used to it these (laughs) days. I, I do it all the time. I forget. So, all right. So yeah. Uh, rifle on your bikes. Yeah. So um, a lot of departments, some departments do, some departments don't. That's a program I put together, uh, even before I was a motorcycle officer, I was interested in the unit. And the problem with motors units, uh, is not the problem, but they're running around during the days for the most part. Why don't we run at nights a lot? Well, we don't have spotlights and the dangers become tenfold when you run at night. So, um, at, you know, and because they're at the days, we can, you know, you, you talk about your um, active shooter type stuff, your schools, your theaters, whatever. We've all seen that nationwide escalate. And your motors officers are out and they're everywhere um, and they have a pistol. And so I put together a program and I had looked at a lot of different motors units. So uh, I put to, put it together. There are, there are systems. Um, it takes up we already don't have room in our saddlebags. That's one of the bitches by guys, and I get it. Um, is that now you've taken up a whole set? We got to carry coats, and we got to carry gloves, and flashlights, and and um, you know all, all the other stuff. So we did. We went with short-barreled AR-15s, and uh, they have a locking system just like a rack in your patrol car, and uh, it has a sequence that we can unlock it. You know, an electronic sequence, and uh, that we know, and we can grab it. It's a short-barreled. We bought them from a company. I for, I'm not going to prop the name of the company. I'm not that happy with them. Um, I would again. We talked about earlier. 
about them not caring about the end user. Do you think they asked, I put up a proposal on the ones we wanted. Do you think they went with those? Nope. Low bid. Low bid. And uh, we've had pr- some problems with them. I fixed most of them um, with some, uh, we'll just leave it at that. But so yeah, short barreled AR-15s in our saddle bag that we are all running. At one time, didn't your department have them out in the open? So that's a funny story, and I won't name <laughs> names. Do you know the story? No. Okay, so um, th- this is the kind of stuff cops like hearing about. So uh, just the government debacles. So for a while, uh, back in the day, they were trying shotguns, and there are external to county uh, where I work. The sheriff's office carries rifles, but they carry them externally on their BMWs because they absolutely don't have room in saddlebags or anywhere to carry rifles. So they're they're carrying them externally. There's some issues with that. You got to be careful of rain and dust and dirt and grime and all that kind of stuff. But um, there's ways to do that. But we they were carrying uh, 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 shotguns and they they had them in a rack and it was designed. I think it was designed uh, locally by the our uh, radio shops or city departments or something. And uh, my current sergeant, he was a motors officer back then. I, no, it wasn't him. It wasn't my sergeant. It was another guy. And he went through an intersection, dude, and uh, he hit the bumps. He was going code, and you know, intersections, you ca- can catch a little air. Well, he caught just a little bit of air on his Harley, and uh, the freaking shotgun dude came out of the rack, into the room, no shit. pieces and shit everywhere. That day, dude, they yanked all the shotguns from the, they said, that's not a good system. And they were picking up shotgun parks in the middle of the intersection shit, dude. So they, at that point, and, and so for years, they didn't carry anything. And I finally go, you guys <laughs> just get some damn rifles. Uh, I knew other departments that were doing it and uh, put them in the saddlebag. So yeah, there you go. That's the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. So that was the answer I wanted. That's a good one. <laughs> I had a great story. Isn't you can picture that shit. Well, I, for mm. sure. Um, Wow. So did he, just a quick question. I don't know if you know the answer. Did he realize it had come off? Or oh, yeah. He, oh, okay. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. some citizens going, no, oh, I think some it, motorcycle just kept on flying down the road. There's guns laying out here. Right. Yeah. No, I think he uh, heard the, the, the debacle and uh, the, the rattling and the gun going, <laughs> you know, it's just. You know, <laughs> He's looking in the mirror going, sparks oh, and shit. shit. Yeah. yeah. At least it didn't go off, dude. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, dude. Um, just real quick, I want to talk a little bit about being, uh, risks on bikes versus a car. So obviously other traffic, uh, being able to see is a big thing, just the size and, and, uh, the light packages, although the bikes are looking like Christmas trees these days, mm-hmm. uh, pretty good on the light packages. So LED good. technology is helpful with that. Yeah. Um, how well do you think you're seen when responding code? I mean, I don't know how your bike's set up. I haven't seen it, but you got to just be freaking careful rob and that's all there is and if i could teach motors officers you know we do a lot of we didn't talk a lot about training or i think we kind of skipped over that we can go back to that if you want um here locally but um you'll have to write it because i won't remember it um that's up to you on time but uh yeah you know you don't you know here's funny i'm in a unmarked car right now with no overhead light bar um for winter and i forget how much you aren't seen in that like just right. no overhead. I, I'm like, holy shit, people. D- you know, right? I remember, so think about a motorcycle. I remember when me. when I did have overhead uh, a light bar on the top, and we did not have side lights, so oh. you couldn't clear intersections. You know what I mean? Now I've totally. got a, I've got a running board strip on my car. I've got, I mean, lights on my mirrors, my push bars. I got lights all over the damn place. But I remember when you didn't have any of that shit. You know? Do you yell out your window too for the extra? Wee- oh yeah. Well, sometimes it's louder than the siren. Wee- 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 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, it's hard. You have to just, that's a whole nother thing that it's hard to teach a motor school. We do take them out and let them run code. That's something that takes time and you just have to learn to stop you. It's so dangerous. And there's, I could get, if this isn't a motor school class because I'm an instructor, I want to give all the tips and tricks. Just, I'll just tell you motorcycle officers nationally die more than any other motorcycle. Do you know that stat? No. Yeah, that's pretty pretty well known in the motor. If you're a motors officer, you know, um, they die more than any other position in law enforcement. Happens all the time, and if they don't die, it's career ending injuries. So, um, although it's scary, it's it's sad. It uh, you have to have that in your mind every day, and I do, and which is why I train myself so hard um, to minimize those risks. And there's so many things you can do to do that. Um, all I can say is you learn the techniques and you're 10, 15, 20 times as careful as you are in a car. You just don't get a second chance. So I don't go that fast. 
I'm an experienced officer. I got 24 years on. I don't need to go fast. It's not a big deal to me. Um, I have a minimum speed that I'll go over depending on what roads I'm on, and I'll stare at my speedometer, you know, and keep looking down and go, I'm not breaking it. I don't care. Unless well, it's an officer that needs help, right. you know, but for a wreck, the I'll crash get, has already happened. Correct. You're not going to get there and stop it. Right. The road's blocked. We're going to get there. We want to get there around traffic because it would take an hour otherwise. That's really what I use it for. And uh, if you have that mindset and you're not a hot dog, um, you'll have a much better uh, chance of survivability out there. And you just have to stick to that code. I've got a family. I've got two lovely daughters, a wife. Uh, I just, at this point in my career, I want to get through to retirement. I've got lots of big plans. I got a side business I'm excited about, you know? So um, anyways, yeah, I could, I could uh, dwell on that, but yeah, look at, look it up. Motorcycle officers, absolutely the, one of the most dangerous positions. I think it is the top for losing officers uh, in, in the law enforcement, in, in the United States. I don't know if that's uh, nationally, but. And proportionate, think of the amount of motors officers versus patrol officers on the street, you know? That is the scary part. And that's yeah. what I'm talking so about. So you're I'm looking at you like that a, point up. when you're looking at like maybe a, a murder rate, uh, in a small town versus a big city, you got to look at per capita, and that's how you judge it. So, if you're looking at proportionate, you know, what's one percent of U.S. law enforcement on bikes? You know, I mean, yep. I don't Good know, what, call, I don't dude. know what the percentage is, but I think that's a fair number. Are you searching for the easiest and quickest detachable luggage system for your motorcycle? Rick Rack has just what you're looking for. Forget all those frustrating straps and bungee cords that can come loose and slap your paint. Check out one of Rick Rack's awesome quick attach strapless luggage rack systems. This father-son team designed something really special. You can't find it anywhere else, yep. And these guys ride, so they truly understand the needs of bikers. The Rick Rack Quick Attach System is strong, durable, and secure with a lockable system. Also, check out their full line of quality touring bags to accompany your quick detach system. Once you use Rick Rack, you'll never go back. What are you waiting for, bikeaholics? Head over to lawabidingbiker.com forward slash store and check out our full line of Rick Rack systems and bags. Um, so my next question for you, and you're a motors officer, so do you guys cover in motor school, um, and we covered this in the academy quite a bit, I don't, uh, it's been a while, but uh, ambush attacks, what, do you guys train for that? Is that something that's even talked about? Because you're out in the open. Because Rob does this on my podcast all the time. I'm going to see if I can get it. It's not like a can. Oh, I'm opening a beer, if you guys wonder. A Space <laughs> Dust IPA. Try it if you haven't had it. He's always popping his cans in the early days in my podcast just to annoy me. Um, totally professional here. Um, all right, so we do. Um, one of the things that we uh, uh, train on is we take the bikes to the firearms range. We try to do it regularly. And initially, when officers train as motor officers, um, uh, we get them up and running with that. So we take them out to the range. There's only so much you can plan on. We have them go to the range. Uh, we have them shoot from their bike. Um, we also, the, and, and I said earlier, Rob, the one thing you have to get over as a motorcycle officer, especially when you're learning, is you're going to dump your bike. Quit being embarrassed. People think that's such a big deal. It's not, you've, you've seen it. You've dumped your bike. You dumped it this yeah. year on the Midwest trip. Big deal. Yep. I was on a hill just like you talked about. And big deal. Big, big, we have crash bars for that. They go down, you pick them up. Um, man up. So... We train them to shoot from their bike, to stop. We teach them how to pop the clutch and hit the brake and kill your motor. You know what I mean? So that you can maintain control of your bike. And even on traffic stops, I have drawn from my bike um, in the saddle position with both feet down because I, somebody jumped out of a car and I'm totally prepared to shoot from my bike. The other thing we teach them is it's okay to dump your bike. And we'll just step off and we'll let the bike dump to the left side or, you know, or the right side. You could do either. I usually let it dump to the left side and I can immediately go down to my belly and use that engine and that fairing and everything and lay on the ground and shoot from behind it. I mean, it's minimal cover, but it's better than, than, you know, it's not just concealment, it's, it's cover, um, and shoot behind the bike in and around the bike and all that kind of stuff. So, um, we do, and, uh, we train and getting the rifle out, which is kind of a, it's not quick like a car. It's just takes a lot more to manipulate. You got to open a saddle bag. You got to hit the switches. You know, we're not probably on a traffic stop. It'll be long over before we get our rifle out. Really what the rifles are for, um, you know, is for, you know, going to schools, mass, you know, active shooter type stuff right. like that. Or yeah. responding to res some, uh, yeah. something other officers involved in. Yes. You got a chance to get out, grab your rifle and run up to the scene or something. Exactly. Because in a patrol car, you know, when I was on patrol on some hot calls, 
um, and I'm sure you've done it when you know it's hot. You're like, uh, this could this could end really bad. I get my rifle out before I get to the scene, yep. and I cock one in. You know, lock one in. You can't do that on a bike. You know, you could get a traffic stop, and somebody comes out blazing. You, you got your pistol, and you know, t- you, you know, we teach separating from the bike too. You know, depending on what kind of cover concealment you have, trees next to your ditches, whatever it is. But yeah, so we do train on that, um, and, and uh, uh, hopefully, you guys are prepared. So yeah, good, excellent. Um, my next question would be advice for someone trying to get into motors. What classes can they take? Say their department's not like yours is not willing to send them to training because, hey, we're not going to spend the money on you. We don't know if we're going to get you in that position, whatever. Is there classes out there? And you, and you touched on it earlier. You said that you get these questions all the time on your podcast, but what classes can I go find? Okay. So all your, uh, you know, all your departments were law enforcement officers were legal, you, you know, and each state's different, but you know, go out, get your, you got to get a motorcycle endorsement. Don't show up to the police interview for a motors unit and go, have you ever ridden a motorcycle? That's one answer. And that's okay. We've taken guys that have never ridden before. We'll train you. It's cool. Some will make it. Um, that's another subject we could talk about too. Um, we lose a lot of people. It's one of the most difficult schools. You'll you talk to guys who have been through motor school, dude. I've heard motors and DRE. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say DRE too. One of the most challenging yet rewarding, but we lose a ton of people. It is not for everybody. If you think you're just can, we can't teach everybody just like fire firearms. You just can't teach everybody. So, um, uh, God, what was the base question? I'm just get rambling. Classes somebody can take to prepare themselves. So motorcycle endorsement, get your motorcycle endorsement, at least get out there and try to ride some bike. There aren't a lot of classes, but I would at least go like in our area, there's a company that gives a little bit of, it's not, you'll be hard pressed to find classes that will teach you how to be a motorcycle officer. There's ex motorcycle officers teaching schools. Look around, look around. Um, there are some of that, but at least go to like some of these, there's different names for them in different States. Um, private, are you talking about private right, classes yeah. that you can take? And then you, then you don't have to take the department of licensing test. It's kind of like the driver's ed. If you take driver's ed, you know, you don't have to take the test. Um, there's some that do that and they're at least above the regular department of department of motor vehicle or DOL, whatever your state calls it, to, uh, uh, schools do what you can get that resume going and it's only going to help you too. So you aren't so shocked when you do go to school, they're not going to teach you how to do full bar locks and stuff like that. Um, but they're at least going to get you more comfortable with the bike. Get out there, get your own bike. Even if it's a cheap bike, go get yourself a, a Harley Sportster. Um, if you're riding metric bikes, go out and get a metric bike. Get a Suzuki, get a Honda, you know, figure out what your department's riding. The more you can get out there, and I know we started the episode by saying a lot of people learn bad habits. Uh, and, and I say that funny. There are some people with some messed up habits. But by far, even guys that have ridden and experienced some bad habits, if you have a good instructor... I feel like I it's I feel like I can overcome that hurdle with you if you have the will um, as a motorcycle instructor I can I can get you over that hurdle. The more you can get into that interview and you know and and uh, you know show them that you, that you've done these things to prepare. Um, it just it, it makes me think when a guy shows up and do, hasn't done anything or ridden a motorcycle like do you care because you need to really like motors. Have you ridden a motorcycle in 108 degree weather? for hours. Have you done that? If you haven't done that, that's why a lot of guys aren't prepared to be a motorcycle officer. You know, they go to school and then they get out on the street and they're like, holy shit, I didn't know I was going to have to ride for three weeks in 105 degree weather, 108 degree weather with a 250 degree engine underneath my legs, frying my balls, you know? That's the difference. Yeah. And that's the real deal. So anything you can do to prepare yourself and you may find really quick, go on a, go on a five hour ride on a motorcycle. See what that feels like in hot weather or extreme cold weather. See what kind of gear you need. It may not be for you. We've had guys do that, get bikes and go, you know, I like riding, but I did some days and I'm just not interested in that every day. So, you know, there you go. But schools are uh, hard to come by, but at least do a couple, get your endorsement and, uh, you know, go to one of those schools where it ups your riding ability a little bit and practice yourself. The other thing I'll tell you, attend some motorcycle, uh, like our department, it may be an option at some departments out there, Rob, for people, we allow people of interest that are really interested in becoming. That's what I did. And I went to trainings for years. I just showed up at their trainings and they let me ride and I learned as much as I could. And I asked a lot of questions and then they were like, this guy's so interested. They sent me to motorcycle school because they knew probably in a couple of years there was going to be openings and they wanted to get me trained up. So, you know, do that, go out, get, 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 get as much knowledge as you can. Listen to the law abiding biker podcast. Oh, shameless plug. Listen Jeez. to the law abiding biker podcast. Oh, there you go. We'll, we'll post-edit that, get that out of there. 
Okay, so no doubt, dude. I'm shameless. I, I see that. So one thing I want to ask you, and take motors officer out of it. So police officer, from Ryan the police officer to the listeners out there, what is one helpful tip from you, 24 years, to help them get through their career? And just real quick, and we'll get right back into your interview. Of course, we love our patron members. We want you to become a patron. We want you in the private Facebook group. We want to get to know you better. But hey, if the only way that you want to support us is through a flat donation, well, then we never balk <laughs> at a flat donation. And we want to thank the following people, Stephen Baber, Greg Miller, and Lawrence Bruce of Cape Coral, Florida. Thanks, guys. LawbitingBiker.com forward slash donate is how they got involved and it helps put a little fuel in the Law Abiding Biker gas tank so we can keep this thing heading on down the road. And uh, thank you so much for those flat donations. Let's go ahead and get back into your interview. Okay. Wow. There's a lot of things I could say. That's a that's a s- surprise question, Robbie. But I like it. I like being surprised. Everyone's gonna get asked. I'm so that. I'm so nervous on these mics, dude. <laughs> Do I sound nervous? Is my voice crackling? So yeah. You, yeah, you're you're gonna get the guest in here though. Not to get off track, you're gonna get the guest in here. I've had him. I'll teach you some tips for that, dude. But beer. you're gonna yeah, dude. Well, beer. But you just yeah, it's hard, dude. At, I did it wrong at first. But you're gonna get some guys in here who've never been on a mic, and they're gonna be like, you're gonna be asking those questions, and they're gonna go, they're gonna give you like a three word answer. What's the your your question will be, what's your worst thing? What do you hate most about the motorcycle unit? And they're going to go, when I can't ride anymore. And you're going to be going, they're not going to be like me, like diarrhea mouth, dude, where they can just talk biker shit. You mean like uh, you're hurt and can't ride anymore? Right, yeah. <laughs> it's it's painful, dude. You'll hear it on your interview too. You'll be editing the episode going, hey, I'm not sure if that's ready for prime time. But yeah, <laughs> it's not the people's fault. People just get nervous, dude. Um, So my advice I can tell you this. I have been through a lot. I have been through an officer-involved shooting um, back in 2000, December 23rd, 2016, right during this time. Interesting. It's yeah. the 23rd today. What the? Yep. That's weird, dude. Perfect, How weird perfect is Perfect day that? for the question. Dang. So I've been, I've been peer support. Um, I've been through some really rough times. We all have, um, both personally and, and professionally, um, and I'm not afraid to admit that stuff. Uh, don't be so proud when we, God, I could, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this a little bit simpler. We could go down that road. Did I just keep yourself mentally healthy? You got to do, you've got to keep yourself mentally healthy. This career will eat you alive and it's ate me alive before. Um, I know you hear it. You guys cannot eat live and breathe law enforcement. If that is your, if you're identifying and I did it, I'm telling you, I'm not, I I am preaching, um, here, um, through experience. Um, and you all know who I'm talking about. We all did it. Robbie, you did it. Everybody did it. Um, if you can get, I see young officers being, um, it's a different generation, whether you like uh, millennials or not, it's a different generation. And I'll be quite honest at it a lot of them are better in it than we were. We self-identified 24 years ago and there wasn't mental health stuff. Dude, you didn't talk about it. You went to the you SIDS death and you sucked your, sucked your shit up. You, you went to the hanging and the guy that blew his, blew his head off. Debriefings, dude. Well, yeah, right. What a fucking joke, dude. There's no debriefings. If you showed any weakness, you got eaten alive. And so for years, guys did that like me. And, uh, you know, we've got all these, uh, for the most part, and I don't know how it works in, in different states, but here in the Northwest, generally, we're getting better. We're still not perfect. Find yourself a really strong hobby um, away from law enforcement um, that, 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 that you're passionate about. Whether that, for me, I love making, I'm a filmmaker, um, I'm a photographer, I, you know, I'm artistic that way with the podcast and the YouTube channel. That's what drives me. Because when I leave work, I don't even think about work. Um, and there was years that I did. And the government and the politics will eat you alive. We're not scared, and I think a lot of listeners will relate to this, we're not scared of meeting the bad guy in the alley. Although we're cautious about it, That that's not what we stress about. A lot of guys that end up, you know, in, in, it's a very small percentage, but, you know, suicide 
it's a high percentage within law enforcement, the career, so I shouldn't minimize that. But alcohol, drugs, um, it's the internal shit that eats you up. It's the internal investigations. It's the politics that go on internally. It's the bullshit, the city council, the funding, the bullshit, rabbit trails, the, the, just what we've talked about, about them not asking what you equipment is best for you and all these things. So find something the sooner you can. You could be in law enforcement today and you could be out tomorrow. I see too many guys these days, Rob, and I see I'm on a tangent, dude. Here, no, is go. this all right? Feed me. This is good. I see too many guys these days relying on your law enforcement career, and I did too, and it's a dumb position to put yourself in. Don't go take stupid criminal justice. Don't take that stuff. Get yourself a degree in something else. I have so many skills, and Rob does too. He runs a side business. We're developing skills. I can... I could edit video for people. I make documentary films. I could go do photography, professional photography for people. I can build websites. I can market myself. I see these guys retiring, and the only thing they can do, and I'm not putting them down if you're listening and you do that. It's okay. It's not where I want to be. They got no choices. If you think your law enforcement career and credentials are going to get you a good job when you retire, you're full of shit. Think about it. Law enforcement is specific to law enforcement. So what do you end up doing? You go end up working for a private security company or standing in the federal courthouse with a gun and a badge. I'm not saying that's bad if that's what you choose to do. Um, get you got to get yourself some skills. You can get taken out tomorrow. You could get an injury. I've seen it with guys, and they got no marketable skills. What are they good at? Law enforcement. Well, law enforcement doesn't transfer over to the private sector. I'm telling you guys, if you've only worked government in your life, that's foolish. You, you need to have something that you can fall back on in private industry. So when you are injured tomorrow, it can be you, that you have very valid skills to, that are current that you can use in private industry that you can market yourself because you won't always be able to stand with a badge and a gun. And, you know, and those can also be passion projects, you know, and like I say, your side gig that keeps you away from law enforcement in the meantime. And you may never get hurt and hopefully not. God, you know, we all pray for that. You'll never be hurt or maimed and you can just use it. So when you do retire, you can fall like me and Rob. We run side businesses. You know, we know when we retire, we, we've got it. Everybody's got to work right now for the most part, especially in the Northwest, just to pay for medical insurance. So I would rather work for myself or do something that I enjoy and I'm passionate about and, and filmmaking and art, and, you know, uh, the, the artistic part of it, the, the creation part of it, than have to go settle for working for some other person. We, we work too hard in this career. We, does, we owe ourselves the ability to go into private industry and not have to rely on our cop skills to get us into that small niche market. I agree. And, and did uh, I, did I ramble too much? There? No, no, you, I get passionate you went, about a, it. You went a couple ways with it, but that's I want to help guys. I want to no, help no, no, guys. No, that's good. I think uh, that's a future podcast, not only uh, mm. entrepreneurship while you're a police officer, but also uh, mental health and, and how guys with some experience have coped. I could talk a lot about those subjects. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I love talking this stuff. No, no, it's great. And then the entrepreneurship thing, if you can find something that you can work for yourself when you retire, when you retire, do you want a set schedule? Right. Or, or is that when you want to enjoy your retirement? And like me, my side business, you know, I, I'm... We work out of our houses. Yeah, I'm dabbling, computers. In, I'm dabbling in this podcast thing, but I've got some other stuff going. And I can work remotely for the most part. I mean, other than I, I need to be here to deliver orders, but I can, you know, push that four or five days either way if my wife wants to go to somewhere on, on vacation Absolutely. or whatever. Absolutely. take your laptop with you like me. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So smart, smart, dude. Yeah. Smart stuff. Yeah. You're right. That's just can go down on a whole nother episode, dude. And yeah, I can talk mental health stuff. I've been involved in that a lot. I've done a lot of critical incident debriefings when I was peer support. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've helped a lot of guys through stuff. I've had to help myself through stuff. Um, yeah. And one of the best things that helped me, I'll tell you right now, um, was starting my gig, uh, my side business six years ago, law abiding biker media. It's been the best thing that I ever did in my life for my personal development and well-being and mental health and i'll say this uh, just to piggyback on that just a little bit you, you know there's guys at work that get to the point where they can retire and they stick around for a few more years and they're miserable hmm. hate that but you and i are probably both to the point in our personal lives where if we left tomorrow it's a nice point to be at where i know i could survive exactly but that doesn't mean i have to turn into the salty asshole cup it just means that i know I'm happy with my personal life. I'm happy with what's going on, and I can survive. 
And you separate them. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you have to turn into a jerk to admin, a jerk to everybody you work with because, oh, I don't need this fucking place. You know, and there's guys that yep. are like that. And you, there's no no place for that. Why? If you're miserable, leave. No one's putting a gun to your head and holding you here. You don't like it, leave. Right. Because you're dragging everybody else in the shitter. Yep. No, it's it's good. And, you know, without getting financial, you know, it's, uh, we don't get paid a lot as police officers, honestly. Northwest is, we get paid a lot more than a lot. And some people will go, bah, at me that are, you know, down south or something going, you fuckers up there, you know. We do do well. Um, but, you know, a lot of the guys that bitch uh, about all that stuff are just living, you know, and paycheck to paycheck. And it's kind of, maybe they've overextended themselves a little bit without going down that. Just, you know, instead of bitch about it, Go do something. How many days off? Like our our patrol guys, not my schedule, but our patrol guys, you know, five on, four off, five on, four off, five on, five off. You're telling me within those five days, that's you only work 15 days a month? Go get a fucking job and make a little extra cash or something. I mean, you know, do something to develop yourself. God, again, a whole nother episode. Those are the salty guys. It's like, dude, what are you doing to better your situation? You're just going to come here and complain. And I get it. You're not going to get paid anymore here, bro. It's government. It's government. And no matter how... God, that's a whole nother subject. No matter how well you do, they can't give you a raise. So you got to do it. Right. You got to do it for yourself. You got to do it for yourself. Yeah, God, we could go down a whole entrepreneur thing there, Robbie. God, I'm cutting you off. Well, geez, we could talk. You know me. I love, I love BS and dude. I can talk biker stuff and Leo stuff and yeah, all day long, man. So um, one of the things I want to do on this podcast when we near the end, so it's going to be one of our first episodes, is I want to read a line of duty death from the Officer Down Memorial page. So I'm going to take one that's just recent here. You need some background music, but you don't have it right now. Like the, the uh, you know, funeral music, dude. Bagpipes. I got a good song for you. Like Perfect. in the background. Perfect. I'll send it to you. Excellent. So I just want to read one here. So uh, two police officers that died recently, police officer Eduardo Marmalejo and police officer Conrad Gary were struck and killed by a South Shore Line commuter train Jesus. while investigating a shots fired call in the area of 103rd Street and Dauphin Avenue at 6.20 p.m. They were investigating the sounds of gunfire that had been detected by a shot spotter sensor in the area. So those of you that don't know what that is, that is a uh, program that can come into your city set up and it will locate shots fired calls when they're, when they're, uh, they're shot. So as they arrived at the scene, they observed a suspect running up an embankment towards the railroad tracks. They were both struck by the outbound train while they pursued him across the tracks near 133rd, 103rd Street, Rosemore Station. A handgun and shell casings were recovered near the scene by other officers. The suspect they were chasing was apprehended a short time later. So Officer Marmalejo had served with the Chicago Police Department for two and a half years and was signed to the 5th District Kalamit. He is survived by his wife and three children. Officer Conrad Gary Charles has served the Chicago Police Department for 18 months and was signed to the 5th District Kalamit. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, he is survived by his wife and child. Officer Gary was a U.S. Air Force veteran. So shout out to those guys and their families. Um, you know, just... In this job, you've got to keep those guys in mind and, and learn and and uh, you having technical difficulties. Dude, my mic's falling off the. <laughs> I'll so, hold it up. It's cool. It's cool. Um, those of you that don't go to the officer down memorial page, I strongly suggest it. I think it's really important to keep yourself grounded and see what other officers have gone through that has uh, ultimately led to their demise and what you can learn from it. So I go to that. Uh, I wouldn't say you know like once a week or anything like that, but uh, especially you newer guys. Keep an eye on that. So, all right, we're going to take it out here. And Dude, can before we take it out, seriously, um, sorry I was listening, but I had a, a technical difficulty where the, the mic stand fell off the table, cheap mic stand. We're, we're learning here at, at the uh, old uh, uh, Thin Blue Line podcast here. Um, anyways, yeah, uh, God rest their souls, and, and uh, yeah, definitely. Um, all right, take care of yourselves out there, guys. Uh, anything else, buddy? I don't think so for this episode. Good job. Thanks. All right. We'll catch you later. So here you go. A little music on the way out. Robbie, on the way out. I'm hand-holding my mic now. Um, how can people... Uh, you getting a website going or what, bro? I am. FindBlueLinePodcast.com. That's going to be coming up here soon, and it's not up yet. You can also email me at Rob at FindBlueLinePodcast.com. You can find me on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play. Yep, or any other podcast aggregator app. I'll help Robbie get up, and we'll be everywhere. We'll be uh, all the, the podcasts. And at some point um, in the future, we'll get you an app going through your audio 
uh, host will get you your own personal app, which will be the best way you can have a phone. You have a phone number yet for him to leave feedback or not? Not yet. It's okay if you don't. No, I, I do, but I don't have it right <laughs> handy. So don't call and leave your feedback uh, for Rob at this point because uh, we don't have a phone number. But that's all right. Uh, yeah, we'll get up and running. Oh, we'll get you a speak pipe, dude, so that they can leave that computer voicemail from anywhere in the world right from there. We'll get you that, too. Uh, yeah, that's let's an do easy it. way. Feedback, some of the best way, because uh, I know there's a lot of... Don't be embarrassed, all you Leos out there who are too afraid to put yourselves out there. I know how you are, all reserved and worried. and uh, Yeah, get you some listener voicemails. You can reach me oh, on my phone number it, found it. 208 918 Three zero two five, and we also have a Facebook page up and running. Find Blue Line Podcast. We'll see you there. Have a good one. We're out. Okay, there you go, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, a little deeper look into uh, my full time position there as a Leo Motors officer. Again, that was courtesy of the fine blue line podcast uh, of course your host over there none other than ld la dog uh, we had a lot of fun uh cracked a few beers and it was just really cool uh for me to just be a guest um to just relax and not have to run the show for once and just just talk i just love chatting like that and uh, boy we could have got a lot deeper as you probably heard in there and went even a lot longer so i'll probably be i, I would imagine uh, talking to him i'll probably be guest hosting on that uh in the future so who knows what kind of topics will come up and if it's something that i think is a crossover a little bit or something you guys would be interested of course i'll let you know about it uh if you want to head over there and, and hear any of those interviews all right guys so call to action uh here we go as we go into 2019 here don't get Stranded guys, gals, that's right, get hooked up with our Cruise Tools RTH3 Roll-Up Travel Toolkit for Harley-Davidson and American-made V-Twin motorcycles. The way I understand it is Big Daddy Kane is working on a toolkit that hopefully will bring to the store for Indians. Um, kind of more specific to Indians because he does have an Indian chieftain uh, limited, I believe, right now. So... Hopefully, see that coming to the store. Anyways, we do have them in our store right now for the Harley and American Made V Twin. That's right. Why get stranded and have your bike towed over a small repair, guys? We've had to use those toolkits. Trust me, you'll want to have one. This quality made toolkit has everything you need for a roadside emergency repair. A lot better than the one that comes with your Harley. Trust me, um, it's missing some things. Tested and used right here by the Law Abiding Biker Crew. Yep, has our stamp of approval. Get it already. That's the Cruise Tool RTH3 kit. That's right. We brought it right to the Law Abiding Biker store for you. LawAbidingBiker.com forward slash store. Nothing but five-star reviews. Big Daddy Kane, Grunt, Fuente down there. They have it ready in stock. They'd love to package it up and uh, do, have it delivered to your doorstep. There you go, guys. All right. I hope you guys are all well, and I definitely hope you're all out there getting some riding. And thanks for listening as usual. 